Can you believe it? <laughs> I, love, I love March Madness. This is one of my favorite times of year. Uh, it's such an awesome thing to be able to watch all these games, these close games with buzzer beaters and uh, teams that should never be in it or have a chance to win, uh, beating larger schools. Uh, how many of you, your brackets are already busted? Yeah, yeah. First day, really the first couple of games, uh, I was already, my bracket was already busted. Uh, but it is so much fun, and, and one of the things I love about it is as you're watching the games, there's so many times where it just seems like all hope is lost for some team. Hey, maybe even before the game has started, you're thinking, all right, there's no way this 16th seed team is a chance, all hope is lost, uh, or there's some big advantage, some big lead that a team has, and then the unthinkable happens. You know, there's this giant comeback moment, a buzzer beater type moment, and it's so exciting. Uh, it's so exciting to see everybody celebrate, and it's truly one of the things I love about this time of year is March Madness. Uh, but I wonder in the room today, how many would say, you know what, I feel like uh, all hope is lost. That in some area of your life today, you feel like, you know what, I just don't feel like there's hope. I feel like all hope is lost. Maybe, maybe it's a health diagnosis. Maybe recently you got a scary health diagnosis and you're looking at it and you're just thinking, you know what, I don't know. It seems like all hope is lost. Uh, maybe it's a job situation. Maybe you feel stuck in your job. You've been in your job a long time. You just feel like all hope is lost. I'm never going to go anywhere. This isn't going to be good. Um, maybe it's a relationship. You've been in a relationship for a while and you've put a lot of invested energy and all of that in it, but just now starting to feel hopeless. And maybe it's a relationship with, with a child uh, or a grandchild, something heartbreaking that you just don't feel like uh, there's any hope for. Or maybe it's your marriage. Maybe there's for a while now, you started to sense like there's no hope, all hope is lost. Or maybe there's been a crisis in your marriage, something that's happened, something unexpected, maybe betrayal. And now you feel like there's just no hope. All hope is lost. Or maybe today, if you were to be honest and we were just to talk, you'd say, you know what? I feel like there's no hope for me. I feel hopeless. I don't feel like things can change. I'm beginning to feel hopeless. Wherever you're at today, whoever you are, I want you to hear clearly the truth of God's word today. And his word says today, listen, when all seems lost, there is hope found at the cross. When all seems lost, when you feel like there is no way God can make a way, He's been doing it for a long time. And you are no exception to God's grace, to his mercy, to his power that can change your life, that can change your marriage, that can change your future. You see, storms are inevitable in life. We all go through them. I know I've been through some myself. And in that time when your life is shaken it feels like sometimes it all can come crashing down. You feel like I'm being shaken, that I'm being taken down to the studs, or maybe you feel like you're taken all the way to the foundation. And in that foundation, as you begin to look, you might see different cracks, you might see different things that need to be addressed. But we all go through storms. And Jesus has something to say about this. In Matthew chapter 7, which is our central passage of Scripture today, in Matthew chapter 7, Beginning in verse 24, Jesus talks about two different foundations. He says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who has built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, 
and its collapse was great. You see, Jesus is talking about two different men, two different foundations. Let's compare these two for a minute. They have some things in common, actually. Uh, The things they have in common is, first, they're both wanting to build a house. They have that in common. And in this scripture, this passage, what Jesus is sharing is that a house represents a life. They're both building a life. Now, in other areas of scripture, a house uh, might be a, um, a family. You get like the house today, you may be building a family or building a nation um, or something like that. But in this specific, uh, this specific story, he's talking about building uh, a life. And so they both want to build a life. And I don't believe that there's anyone in this room that wants to build a, a, a life that is full, filled with failure, right? Nobody wants to live a life of defeat uh, or destruction, Right? That doesn't, that doesn't happen. No one wants to, to waste their lives. All of us would like to live lives of significance, of purpose, uh, of value, have some sort of meaning. Yet Jesus is saying in this passage, there's two different lives. One that could be built on wisdom by building your life on the rock, a firm foundation, as opposed to foolishness by building on a sandy foundation. So both of them want to build a house. The other thing that they have in common is that they're both going to experience storms. I said it earlier, but all of us in life go through storms, don't we? Um, Storms are actually a very important part of God's plan for your life. You may not want to hear that today, but storms are a very important part of God's plan for your life. It's true. And the reason that these storms, these negative circumstances are an important part of God's plan is because they reveal to us what kind of foundation our life is built on. And so if we have cracks in our foundation, if if there's issues that are deeply rooted in our lives, then when the storms come and things are shaken, it can reveal to us what kind of life our foundation is built on. What storms do is they allow you to see and reveal the type of foundation. You see, God already knows. Uh, He can see it anyways. So there's two different foundations. One is rock and one is sand. And what I'm asking from you today is to do this. As we go to God's word and we hear what God's word says, that you would be willing to inspect the foundation of your life. Is there anything there that's not of God? Is there some deeply rooted sin? Is there um, some sort of cheating or betrayal or something that's in your life? Is your life built on lies or is it built on the truth? Another thing that these men had in common is that they both heard the words of Jesus. They were there for the same sermon, taught by the greatest preacher of all time, Jesus. He taught the, he taught the passage. He taught this, this word, the Sermon on the Mount. But he says, whoever hears these words and then does them, that's the one who is wise. So today, as you inspect your foundation, you hear the word of God. Are you willing to do what God's word says? Because remember, when all seems lost, There is hope at the cross. And we're all building our lives on something. And we're going to see in God's word how to build our lives on a firm foundation. This year, our church made the decision to go through uh, a discipleship curriculum. We decided that discipleship would be a real emphasis for our church this year. And so we're doing something called Master Life. And we've just finished the first book. It was six weeks long. We're about to start in the next book. And there's still groups that you can jump into, by the way. Uh, But it's been fantastic. It's been great. I've been doing it with a group of guys. And each week, we're learning how to be a true disciple of Christ, how to build your life truly on the cross, a firm foundation. And so you're going to see that uh, as, as we look through this Uh, today, um, I want you to think about something before we jump into that. I want you to think about the cross and what it represented. You have Jesus Christ who loved you and loved me so much that he was willing to go to that cross to be tortured, uh, to endure the pain, the suffering on that cross so that we could have the forgiveness of sins, 
so that we could experience God's grace in our lives. And and so when I, I talk about having cracks in the foundation, listen, when you go to the foot of the cross and you go to Jesus and you surrender your life to him, by his grace, he can change you He can begin to fill in those cracks and give you a firm foundation. Ephesians says it this way. uh, In Ephesians 4, 21 through 24, it says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. You see the exchange that happens at the cross? We throw off the old life. We throw off our old sinful nature. We surrender it to Jesus and we are made new. We are renewed by the power of the Spirit and God can build something of your life brand new. And so as we've been studying in Master Life and we've been looking to the cross, what we've, what we've seen is how to build our lives on a firm foundation. And the way it all started, and I've been doing this almost every single day since we started Master Life, is it starts with a circle. So you get out a piece of paper and you draw a circle on that piece of paper. And that circle represents your life and that circle represents my life. And, and what's at the center of that circle? What's at the center of your life? And you take a moment of just self-reflection and you truly think about this. And this is a daily decision. Sometimes it's moment by moment. Who or what is at the center of your life? If you were to be honest and transparent today, maybe you would write in money. You know, money's at the center of my life. Uh, Maybe it's about having enough money or having more money. But a lot of your decisions, a lot of how your energy and your time is spent the direction of your life has been about more money. I need to get more money. Maybe money is written at the center. Maybe um, it's, it's something else. Maybe it's some person, someone. You would write their name in the center of your life. And depending on how they're doing, you're doing well. If they're not doing well, you're not doing well. And everything in your life is revolved around that person. Or maybe it's, it's some, I mean, some of these can be good things. Maybe it's your children. Maybe in an effort to, to prioritize and your family and your kids, you, you put your kids' names on the center of that circle where they truly don't belong. But you put them there anyways because you love them and you care about them. So your whole life is just going in the direction of your kids and you're chasing your kids and their dreams and their sports and, and a lot of your time, your energy and money is just spent on your kids. If I were to be honest and I'll be transparent in front of you today, as I look at the circle of my life, the thing I struggle with the most, the thing I can write in many times truthfully is me. Me, what are, what are my desires? What's my plan? What do I want? What am I craving? What do I want to eat? Me, 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 my, my, my. So many times I find myself at the center of my life. Listen, if we're gonna build our lives on a firm foundation, there's only one name that can be written at the center of our life and that's Christ. Christ has to be the center of our lives. And so I'll sit there for a moment, I'll think about my life and and where it's at, and I'll write in, physically write in Christ and say, God, I want the decisions I make today, and I want my thoughts today to be pleasing to you. I want it to be made in alignment with you. God, you are the center of my life. You are the center of my family. Anything worth building, you put Christ at the center. And then after you've put Christ at the center, the foundation of your life, the foot of your life is that of the cross. And that should be God's word. God's word is where we find our footing. That is where we find our firm foundation. We must know God's word. We must fall in love with the words of God. 
You see, this book is, is incredible. And it's not just a book to be studied like any other textbook. This is the living, breathing word of God. When, when we take it in, we are receiving his life into us. It builds us up. It encourages us. It teaches us. It instructs us how to live. And so this is an incredible book that we need to take in. This is the foundation by everything that we do. By the way, our church, we're built on this book. This message today is built on his word. Scripture, the word of God, is the foundation of everything that we do. The, the base of the cross is the word of God. This uh, past week, I was doing some studying, and I looked up what is the tallest building in the world. And what I found is the Burj Khalifa. And this building is in Dubai, and it is 2,722 feet tall. It's over a half a mile. To give you some perspective, that's like stacking the Empire State Building on top of itself. That's how tall this building is. It's twice the height of, of the Empire State Building. Um, it was designed by a firm in Chicago, and they weren't foolish, although they were trying to build the world's tallest building on sand. And so it seems kind of counter uh, to what we're talking about today. And the windstorms uh, in Dubai are, are crazy. I mean, they're incredible, these storms. And so they have to build this structure and make sure that the foundation is very strong. So what they did is they drilled 33 pilot holes deep, deep down into the earth. And the soil that they discovered was rocky, sandy soil. It was not a firm foundation. It was not strong. So what did they do? They brought in more than 110,000 tons of concrete. Uh, they, they installed um, all 192 piles going 164 feet deep. And by the time they were finished, they had built a foundation that could hold 450,000 tons. Isn't that remarkable? It's crazy to think about. But the reason I bring all that up is what stood out to me is what the lead architect said uh, he said, listen, once the foundation is laid, the building starts happening at maximum speed. And I think this is important to know because it takes time to build your house upon the rock, to really build your house in that way, to make it strong, to build your life on the word of God. But if we get the foundation right and we start to really know the word of God, then very quickly at maximum speed, God can begin to build something out of your life. So if you're feeling behind and you feel like all hope is lost and there's no hope for change, let me tell you this today. If you'll dig into the word of God and submit yourself to him and truly found your life on this word, his principles, very quickly at maximum speed, God can give you purpose. He can give you a life of significance, of worth. And so we come and we get to know him through his word. The next part of the cross, and this is all represents our vertical relationship with God. You have the word, you have Christ at the center, and then reaching to the heavens, we have prayer. Prayer is so essential in, in our walks with God. And, and in 1 Timothy 2.5, it tells us this, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, and that mediator is Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus came, uh, he was able through his sacrifice and obedience to provide a way for you and I to be able to meet with God, to speak with God, to talk to God because we get covered in his grace and then we can enter into the throne room with confidence, with boldness because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. So we're given the gift of being able to pray to God and, and, and more than that, we're given the gift to be heard that God would hear our prayers. Isn't that amazing? That the foundation of every uh, relationship is communication. There has to be communication. No relationship can really be healthy apart from healthy communication. This past year, I've done hundreds of hours of marriage counseling, and I'm not just making that up. Uh, I've done hundreds of hours of marriage counseling. And during that time, I've not had one single couple say, you know what? We're just doing a really great job communicating. That's not what I hear. Uh, what I hear repeatedly is, 
we really need to focus and work on how we communicate to each other. Not just exchange information, but how we really truly connect and grow in intimacy. And so if it's important within a marriage and it's important with a relationship, then how is that any different in our relationship with God? You see, we can pray to him, communicate to him, let him hear the desires of our heart, put our burdens, our cares on him, because it says in his word, he cares for us. And then we can receive his word through his still small voice, the Holy Spirit, and through his word that he has written to us. That is what genuine relationship with God looks like, a, a prayer-filled life. It's not just a recited prayer that you say before dinner. It's not just a memorized prayer. And that's, that's fine, it's good. But Jesus even warns against vain repetitions. Truly what he wants is just to know you. It doesn't have to sound great. It doesn't have to sound perfect. You don't have to sound like your favorite pastor or anybody like that. God wants to hear your voice. I was thinking about this. Uh, My kids, I have incredible kids. They're all young. I love my kids. Uh, But I will say there are times where uh, I can't get a lot out of them. You know, the, the school day will be over and I'll say, tell me about your day. It's good. It's fine. Okay, great. And so I'll go some time without hearing much of anything about them. But when they need something, I hear them very clearly, like very clearly. I need this. I need that. And I'll hear it over and over and over again. I need this. I need that. They can make themselves heard. They don't have a problem communicating, okay? Uh, They can make themselves heard. Um, I remember when they were little, uh, I, I loved to hold my kids and cuddle with my kids. But they had so much energy, they'd squirm and they really wouldn't want to cuddle unless they were sick. Uh, because if they were sick and they, or they had a fever, then I could just hold on to them. And those were some sweet moments. You know, I just had my kids on my chest, and I, I didn't care that they were sick. I didn't care that they were burning up. I just would hold them, and I'd love them and pray for them. And there was these sweet moments where I just felt so connected to my kids and their sickness. Listen, a lot of times we can have this same approach with God where we only go to him when we're really sick. When the storm has come, When things aren't really good, then that's when we find ourselves on our knees. That's when we find ourselves crawling up into his lap is when things have gone wrong. Or maybe we just go to him when we have a list of things that we need. I want this, I need this, I need that. You see, here's the deal. God loves you enough to where he'll accept you either way. He wants to hear what you care about. He wants to hear those things. But much more in a deeper way, the Bible says to pray at all times without ceasing. Why does it say that? Why do you think it says that? Because I believe God wants to hear you every single moment of every single day. Just every now and then you're in a busy day, something good happens, you just kind of pull back and say, God, thank you, that was great. Something goes wrong, Lord, I'm really struggling. That, that just happened. Be the first one he goes to to celebrate with things in your life. Run to him in times of need, but just talk to God. Connect with God through prayer. This is essential for a healthy relationship with God is this type of communication. So that's your vertical relationship with God. You've got the word of God that you're planted in, that is your firm foundation. Then you've got the prayer that reaches to heaven. Christ is at the center of your life. And then the first arm of the cross is fellowship. Fellowship. You are designed for relationship with other people. You are. I know some people just cringe hearing that. You're like, oh, I don't want to hear that. Um, But you are. You're designed to be in community. Your faith was never meant to be alone in isolation. And I hear people say, listen, my faith is just kind of my own. You know, I'm I'm kind of quiet about my faith. Uh, I'm private about my faith. This is my own. I don't really talk to many people about it. Or people will say, I feel closest to God, you know, when I'm out in nature, and I don't have anybody around, and I can understand that to a certain level. But if that's all your walk with God is, is you and you alone, then you are not living out God's will for your life. You are not living out his perfect plan for your life. You're missing something, something huge, and that you need to be not just come to church, but be a part of the church, be in the life of the church. We're created for this kind of fellowship. We need that type of connection. Listen to this. Some of you have desi- you've desired for a long time to have some sort of great relationship with another believer, friendship, a connection where you have somebody who can pray for you, that knows what's going on in your life. You've been searching for that person. 
and they may be in this room right now. God may have designed somebody to put in your life that's gonna encourage you and lift you up in hard times and they're in this room right now. But have you taken the time, made the effort to make the connection? You see, when we come to church, we don't just come to church, we are the church. And it'd be easy to come into the church this size and kind of just sneak into the back, hear the word of God, you know, sing some songs of worship and then run back to the car and not really talk to anybody or connect with anybody. Um, that's not what church is. And that's why at Second, we're designed for Bible study and worship. We have almost 40 Bible study classes that you can attend on the weekend, broken up by age, division. We've got uh, married, we have single classes, uh, age and stage of life, many different classes to choose from. If you don't like one, you can just choose another one. And you can find a, a group of people that you can actually connect with, be in Christian fellowship with. You need it. We all do. I need it. And so you go around, you try to find that class either before or after worship. There are classes that you can be a part of. We have master life groups, over 20 different master life groups that you can join that. And, and book two is about to start. We have groups that are starting over again. And so there are plenty of opportunities for connection within this church and you need it. Because here's the truth. Many times when God wants to do something for you, he wants to do it through somebody else. And so you might be at a place where you need encouragement. You're just discouraged and you're going, God, I just need encouragement. Encourage me. I need joy. I feel empty. And God might be waiting for you to get to church, to talk to other believers, and then somebody come up to you and give you an encouraging word to, to encourage you with God's word. And then all of a sudden, wow, okay. I just experienced God's grace through someone else. I just experienced his mercy through someone else, his joy, his encouragement. And then here's the other side of that. God may be wanting to use you to encourage someone else. You might be an extension of God's mercy and his grace and his love. You may be able to say something that brings peace to someone during a difficult time. But you could be missing that whole dynamic if you're not actively a part of the life of the church. And so we need to be here. Another reason we need to be here is for accountability. Listen, we have an enemy. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family. And if you're not a part of Christian fellowship, if you haven't prioritized church and made this an active part of your life and your kid's life, then you are extremely vulnerable. And when the enemy comes and when the storm comes and the house is shaken, you could find yourself in a hopeless situation. But remember, when all seems lost, there's hope found at the cross. And so we have ourselves firmly planted in the word. We're communicating with God in relationship and we have Christian fellowship going on in our lives. Christ is at the center and then the next arm is to witness. You see, when God has done something in your life, when he's put you on a firm foundation, you wanna tell other people about it. You do. When you see someone that's on a sandy foundation or they're struggling or they're going through hard times, you wanna come alongside of them and say, listen, this is what God did for me. God saved me. He rescued me. I, I've experienced his amazing grace. Let me, let me show you some of that grace. Let me show you who God is. Let me show you how he showed up in my life. You can't keep it in. You, you wanna share with the people at your work and in your family. You wanna invite them to church. You wanna bring them into this place where they can hear the word of God, where they can learn to build their life on a firm foundation. We have so many opportunities and our, our, one of the philosophies of our church and something we say all the time in meetings is we exist for those that aren't here yet. So as we're making plans for the future, as we're making decisions for our church, we're thinking about those that aren't here yet. It doesn't mean that we don't think about you. Uh, we still love you. We love your family. Um, but we are kept up at night by the empty chairs in this room because they represent people in your life, in your community, that may not have a church home, that may not know the truth and the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. But how do we get there? How do we fill them? How do we, how do we bring people in? I can't do it all. I mean, we can't. We need you to live out 
your Christian faith, your walk with God by being firmly planted in the word, having an active prayer life, being in Christian fellowship, knowing how wonderful this place can actually be and then wanting just to bring other people into it. And when you are doing all of those things, you begin to grow in your faith. It's, our great, it's the Great Commission. This is our mission statement as a church is to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. We're to go out. We're to make disciples. We're to be faithful in the things that God has called us to do. And when we build our lives on this type of foundation, this firm foundation, the Holy Spirit will be at work and you will grow. God will grow your life into something much greater, much bigger than you could ever ask or imagine. Where are you at today? That's the question. As you inspect your foundation today, are there cracks? Are there cracks in your life? Are there cracks within your marriage? Your business? Your community? Are all those things built on the truth of God's word, a firm foundation? Or when the storms come, is it all going to come crashing down? Listen, if you feel hopeless today, I want you to hear today there's hope. There's hope found in Jesus Christ. There's hope found at the cross. When all hope seems lost, there is hope at the cross because God truly does love you and he cares about you and he's got a great purpose and plan in mind for you and his purpose and plan is so much bigger and so much greater than your plan. And it has been laid out clearly to you today. My question is, in this parable we read about Jesus, you've heard the word, will you do it? Will you truly be wise and build your house upon the rock? Or will you have a sandy foundation that when the storms come, it'll all come crashing down? When all seems lost, there's hope at the cross.